Now, I'm highly honored and feel privileged to have been given the opportunity to introduce Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Khan, Judge, Supreme Court of India. Sir, your life is a portrayal of humility, perseverance, uh, and faith in own potential. Your voice, life is uh, your voice in judiciary and through students in faculty to set aside that deep-seated negative belief that only sons and daughters of well-off families having foreign education can get the success. So, you were born in a, such a humble family in Hisar, Haryana, studied from uh, universities of Haryana and achieved the epitome of success. Your journey from a practitioner of law from district court Hisar to distinction of being appointed as the youngest advocate journal of Haryana in 2000 and elevation as a permanent judge to the Punjab and Haryana High Court in 2004, nominated member of the uh, governing body of National Legal Service Authority for two consecutive terms, assuming charge of the office of Chief Justice of High Court of Himachal Pradesh in 2018 and elevation as a judge of a Supreme Court of India on 24 May 2019 make everyone believe that if small but important step-by-step -step process is followed diligently and persistently it can make a sea of difference in life. This transformation in turn will ignite an individual's natural genius. Sir, with these few words, I humbly request you to please deliver your discourse. Professor Sunil Kumar Registrar Professor Sunil Professor Dinesh B. in Academics, Professor Neelam Sangwan B. in Research, Professor Anand Sharma DSW, Professor Pramod Proctor, Professor Kalpana Chairperson ICC, I think is the real organizer and the, of the today's event. Thank you very much, Dr. Pradeep, coordinator. You have said so many things about me which I might not be deserving. All the learned deans, heads, faculty members, and officers of the university, Professor Ajay Smith, Mrs. Marie from the Law Department. A dear, very close to my heart and vibrant judicial officer, Dr. Pankas. My dear students, ladies and gentlemen, Subject matter of today's Bhakti talk, Vishakha, completing 25 years of journey, is a very sensitive and very introspective subject which requires such like deliberations and serious deliberations at different ends.
today is safe for me and for all of you. It is a special day for multiple reasons. As we saw in the corridor of the newly inaugurated girls hostel, it is the eve of the World Environment Day which we celebrate by planting trees in the hope of a better and greener future. And of course we are celebrating 25 years of the landmark judgment of the Supreme Court of India in Vishakha versus State of Rajasthan. This case was indeed instrumental in transforming the workplace environment for the women of our country. I hope and trust that the addition of the girls' hostel which we have inaugurated today will also be an added strength to the safe working environment, academic environment for the young girls' students here. We are celebrating the commemoration of 75 years of journey as an independent nation. We must also remind ourselves the promises that we made to ourselves from the beginning to become a developing nation by cultivating the ideas of democracy and the rule of law. However, and we must acknowledge, many a times we find that we are not fully succeeded in achieving our constitutional commitments to provide equal opportunities irrespective of player, class, caste and gender. Specifically, the lack of a safe environment for women to come forward and be a part of the workplace. Therefore, Vishakha at 25, Walk the Talk, became so relevant. Dr. Pankas pointed out, and I am repeating it, that injustice or a discriminatory approach at the societal front against the women is not a new phenomenon. How do you react? What happened at the time of Mahabharata? When in a full sabha, a great woman like Dorothy was insulted. And in the presence of those whom the then society and even today, we revel, we pray, and we accept them at a very high pedestal. And such like instances have been time and again repeated in history. The students of history, some of the posters exhibited today tell those stories. When we come back to Vishakha, the today's theme where I am supposed to share my views with you, Dr. Pradeep has very eloquently pointed out that how Justice J.S. Verma, the then Chief Justice of India, evolved a new jurisprudence, identified the vacuum and lacuna in the legislative field, and attempted to fill up those blank parts 
through judicial body. Let's remember the Supreme Court had two options or choices before it. Either to hold its hand and say that we are not competent to resolve these issues as the matter falls within the domain of the legislature or that it's a social issue. And the second option was to step up and fulfill the expectations of the people as envisaged in the preamble of the constitution. And why a judgment is being remembered? Why we have great hopes? How it has brought a landmark change in the society? is only because the Supreme Court opted for the second choice and it went ahead that notwithstanding the lack of legislative policy, lack of any social commitment, this ailment must be undone through a judicial command. And this is how the verdict came. I will just very briefly point out Effects because the young people sitting here might not be aware that how Vishaka ultimately culminated into a judgment. Bhavani Devi was a brave social worker, a member of NGO in Rajasthan. She came to know that a one year old girl child was so to be married with a major young person one year old girl child. She along with members of the NGO protested and raised their voice against this child marriage. The gentleman, Ramkaran Bhujar, who was getting married, became so furious that he along with his associates attacked Bhavali Devi and her husband when they were working in the field. They were mercilessly beaten and Bhavali Devi was then raped by Ramkaran and his associates. Unfortunately, the lack of sensitivity I think Sunday will come to you. You know, Bhavari Devi got a case registered against the accused persons. She herself came in the witness box, deposed that she has been gang raped, and these are the culprits. But despite her best efforts, and because of complete lack of sensitivity on the part of the Sessions Court, the accused were acquitted. Eventually the matter went up to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court not only convicted the accused persons, but also with a view to prevent the menace of sexual harassment to the women for laid down a host of guidelines which are known as Vishaka guidelines. This is a fact that the Supreme Court sought to fill in the legislative lacuna that existed then regarding the protection of women from sexual harassment at the workplace. The three judgments laid down elaborate guidelines for the protection of women employees from sexual harassment. It's worthwhile to highlight some of the key observations made in this judgment. Very briefly, I have just noted them. The Supreme Court said that sexual harassment of a woman at workplace is violating of a host of fundamental rights. And this is how you know the involvement of jurisprudence was started. First, the Supreme Court said it's violating Article 14. You deny it's a denial of equality to the women 
when she is harassed like this. The second violation it was held of Article 15, which prohibits any discrimination based on caste, creed, religion, place of birth or sex. And therefore, the Supreme Court said that such an action is definitely violated of Article 15 also. But the most significant part is the Supreme Court said that it was also violated of Article 21 of the Constitution. It amounts to denying a dignified, respectful life and liberty to the women section of the society. And therefore, having held that it was a composite violation of three fundamental rights guaranteed under the Constitution, the Supreme Court then proceeded to lay down the guidelines for safeguard. One of the court, I will just say what the Supreme Court said, and I am quoting. The right to be protected from sexual harassment and sexual assault is therefore guaranteed by the Constitution and is one of the pillars on which the very construct of gender justice stands. Let's therefore bear in mind that gender equality does not stop at just providing opportunities to women. It also includes protecting them from sexual harassment and guaranteeing the right to work with dignity which is universally accorded as a basic human right. The judgment also, besides as I said, Article 14, 15 and 21, the judgment also took notice of Article 42 of the doctrine of principles of state policy which makes and cast a duty on the state to secure justice and human conditions of birth. But the fact is that at that point of time there was no policy in way. There was nothing enforceable or justiciable on the judicial platform, either by way of an executive form or a legislative form. What are the outcome of the case? The significance of this verdict was that it laid down a set of comprehensive guidelines in hopes of putting an end to the sexual harassment of women at workplace. While framing these mandatory guidelines, the apex court exhibited an extraordinary vision to rectify the legislative to silence and fill up the vacuum with an effective use of the inputs from international instruments such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women which were in consonance with our constitutional ethos. However, it is equally important to note that the court provided contextual clarity as to why it was exercising the power under Article 32 of the Constitution, that's a direct jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. And why the Supreme Court exercised that jurisdiction? I quote, the power of this court under Article 32 for enforcement of the fundamental rights and the executive power of the union have to meet the challenge to protect the working women from sexual harassment and to make their fundamental rights meaningful. Governance of the society by the rule of law mandates this requirement as a logical concomitant of the constitutional scheme. The exercise performed by the court in this manner is with this common perception. The guidelines laid down by the Supreme Court made it imperative for the employees to ensure the prevention of sexual harassment of women in the workplace. On one hand, public sector bodies were to provide within their code of conduct appropriate penalties for prohibiting sexual harassment. And on the other hand, even the private employees, the private sectors were directed to include prohibition in which their standing orders under the Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act 1946. So both the aspects were taken care. The public sector as well as the private uh, sector where large scale employment are there and the women folk is em em employed. Various mechanisms in the form of initiation of criminal proceedings, disciplinary proceedings, Internal Complaints Committee, as the learned Vice Chancellor pointed out, 
and areas of humanity like in the university, even in the private sector, you will find such humanities. Various such directions were also issued by the Supreme Court. I must say, this verdict by the Supreme Court was indeed a proud moment for the whole nation as it travelled far beyond the borders, the Vishakha guidelines inspired other South Asian countries such as Bangladesh and Pakistan to introduce similar reforms. For instance, the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, in one of the decisions that concerned violations against, against women in the workplace, relied upon Vishakha and provided guidelines to be implemented until the Bangladesh government took legislative or executive action to prohibit this kind of illegal actions. Let me also point out a caveat here. It's fact that Vishakha became the lifeline of working women. But there has been a section of the society And in all respect, a part of the intellectual society who have been criticizing the Supreme Court for believing in Vishakha judgment on the ground that it's a case of judicial activism and that the courts sometimes try to overreach the field which is substantially and factually occupied by other organs of the constitution. I am not on the issue whether the criticism is right or wrong, but my concern is that if the other organs of the constitution, namely the legislature, or the political executive of the Union of State fail to address an issue. How can we left the public of this country, the common man of this country, the Indian society in a vacuum, in a directionless manner? and suffering as a victim without any hope of any solution. And therefore, it becomes a bounden duty of the court to come forward and cater those needs of the society which have not been timely addressed. Therefore, in my considered view, Vishakha was neither a case of judicial activism nor of judicial overreach. It was a need of the hour, it was a need of the society, and the Supreme Court befittingly provided a remedy to the nation, to the society, which was urgently needed at that point of time. And this is proved from the efficacy of the judgment. The mandatory implementation of the guidelines laid down in Vishakha have undoubtedly improved the work environment for women, making it more safe, humane and healthy for them to work. These guidelines have also proved to have a huge deterrence effect on the potential harassers. Several enterprises have effectively established com internal complaints committees and have even endeavored to follow the guidelines in that respect. My dear friends, I do not stop with Vishakha only. It's my duty to apprise you that even post Vishakha also, the Supreme Court did not sit silent. 
in April Export Promotion Council versus A K Chopra, that is resentment of 99, as Dr. Pradeep and Professor Vice Chancellor Sir pointed out, the 1997 judgment in Visakha. But just after two years, in 99, in A K Chopra's case, the Supreme Court enlarged the definition of sexual harassment. It is very important, please. This definition was enlarged by ruling that physical contact was not essential for it to amount to an act of sexual harassment. It was one of the plea raised by, of course, uh, the, the element who indulged it, that unless there is a physical contact, there can't be a sexual harassment. Even that part of the court ruled out that it is not necessary that there should be a physical contact to commit this offence. That was in 99, just after two years of the Vishakha. Then came Medha Kotwal Lele's case. This was in 2013. One NGO wrote a letter to the Supreme Court complaining that despite your elaborately very expensive guidelines laid down in Vishakha, the state governments Union territories, and there are many other organs who are not following those guidelines in towards letter and state. That letter by the NGO was converted into a sum out of public interest litigation by the Supreme Court for the purpose of monitoring the implementation of Visa case. And as I understand, in Medha Kotwal's case, Supreme Court issued notice to all the state governments, to the union, and to various public sector organizations and private entities, calling upon them to file affidavits that how and in what manner have you complied with the Vishakha guidelines. So it's not that a judgment is delivered, and after that the Supreme Court is silent. A follow up action and vigorously commanding all these states has been subsequently taken. After 2013, Medha Kotwal case, just in 2020, then Supreme Court again expressed its viewpoint in Nisha Priya Bhatia's case. That is a very interesting case. I am not repeating the facts, but I am pointing out to you. That was a case where some disciplinary actions were taken against a lady officer. She challenged that this is me action, alleging that I have not committed any XYZ misconduct. But the courts decided against her. And even Supreme Court, as far as her misconduct was concerned, Supreme Court said yes, there is a dereliction of duty, and whatever action has been taken by the authorities against her, that is justified, because that is a part of this plea action taken as per the rules, as per the departmental rules. But what the Supreme Court said? That victim had exceedingly insensitive and undignified circumstances due to improper handling of her complaint. That was about her the same. Her action against her is a bad. But the Supreme Court said, found that the victim had faced exceedingly insensitive and undignified circumstances due to improper handling of her complaint of sexual harassment. It was held that since fundamental rights of the victim had been clearly impinged, she was entitled to monetary compensation. So as far as this jurisprudential growth of protecting the women against any type of direct, indirect, remote, physical, sexual harassment is concerned, the Supreme Court is consistently determined to protect and follow up and to expand the principles Founded upon by it in Vishakha's case. I friends, the most significant impact of Vishakha was that it laid down the foundation for the enactment of, as Dr. Pankas pointed out, Dr. Pradeep also said, pointed out, 
the enactment of the sexual harassment of women at workplace prevention prohibition and redressal act 2013 but for this judgment probably the people of this country might have been denied the legislative protection for long years Though the International Labour Organization has remarked that majority of the Indian companies are non-compliant with this act, the success of this act is that it has put in place a mechanism for curbing the instances of sexual harassment. The act contains broad categories of acts or behaviours which constitute sexual harassment. There is also a provision for mandating. the formation of an internal internal complaints committee that uh, that is now formalized everywhere and that committee requires members nominated by the employer out of which at least half of them ought to be women i think that's on pan india basis now this direction that is coupled with this statutory mandate of 2013 act are being religiously complied with by all the institutions why such instances take place why the courts will have to come forward and issue such guidelines why the other sections of the society do not need this kind of judicial or legislative mandate these are also the questions which confront us and in my analytical view the socio economic analysis of gender justice is very important it is true that our constitution promises equal opportunities to all but due to the structural and cultural design of our society the ground reality is that the workplaces are still pervaded by an unsafe hostile environment sexual harassment not only violates the sense of dignity of women but also infringes upon their right to earn a living it is also an impediment to the economic growth of the country only a safe and conducive work environment can enable a woman to work at her full potential as the famous chinese journalist tian wei rightly said and i quote Here are such beautiful lines. Any society that fails to harness the energy and creativity of its women is at a huge disadvantage in the modern world. And that is what precisely happens. Doctor Pradeep was very kind to refer to some of my judgments, including that in this case, when the only issue was. that where unfortunately the aspirant why both lost their lives in a motor accident case the tribunal and the high court took a view that the aspirant will be presumed that he was a able bodied person and was working and earning but as far as the deceased woman is concerned she was a house wife only home maker and therefore it can't be presumed that she had any source of income for which compensation should be awarded now this absolutely discriminatory uncalled for artificial discrimination between the two prompted us to say otherwise and we highlight the what is the importance of house maker and therefore how she contribute to the economy of the family and therefore her loss can and definitely results into a huge financial loss to the family which in terms of the compensatory principles deserve to be suitably awarded and this is how we try to develop that concept i must also remind you that the ground reality and practices of gender discrimination 
against women were a subject matter of debate even before the constituent assembly. Most of you might be knowing, in the constituent assembly, there were 15 women members. One five, 15 mem women members. You know, one of my speech in Ranchi, I said, these 15 women were the mothers of her constitution. There were a lot of discussion and deliberations about the male practices of gender discrimination and which were in terms of degree were at variance depending upon the religious concepts, urban and rural concepts, social and backward concepts, urban and rural differences. At various platforms, different degree of discriminations were being seen and were found to be in existence. It was in this background that two of the persons I would quote before you among the 15 women members there was one Begum Ajia Rasul. While speaking on the fundamental rights, what he said was, under the proposed constitution, it is necessary to ensure absolute protection of fundamental rights without any compromise. She advocated that there was a need to ensure that such rights were being followed in letter and street and bring a society which does not discriminate on the ground of sex known as gender discrimination. There was one other, a great intellectual, Professor Hansa Mehta. She was representing Bombay State at that time in the Constituent Assembly. A great visionary, I would say. What she said, and I am quoting. It will warm the heart of many a woman to know that free India will mean not only equality of status but equality of opportunity. The average woman in this country has suffered now for centuries from inequalities heaped upon her by laws, customs and practices of people who have fallen from the heights of that civilization of which we are all so proud. See, further said, there are thousands of women today who are denied ordinary human rights. They are put behind the prada, secluded within the four walls of their homes, unable to move freely. The Indian women has been reduced to such a state of helplessness that she has become easy prey to those who wish to exploit the situation. In degrading women, please, please listen to the last line what she said. Very, very strong remarks. In degrading women, man has degraded himself. In degrading women, man has degraded himself. What Professor Hansa Mehta spoke in the Constituent Assembly. I must say, these dynamic leaders, these visionaries, these crusaders against social rebels, who, who contributed not only in constituent assembly, but subsequently on political and social platforms, must have persuaded the Supreme Court to envision the guidelines which eventually came to Vishakha, as we are discussing today. Therefore, as an optimist person, I always feel that what has been achieved through Vishakha, the other ailing issues can also be equally hammered and we can resolve those through the activism of all the organs, whether it is judiciary, whether it is legislature or the executive. 
I feel that though the representation of women in public life has significantly improved, it is upon us to ensure that nothing comes in the way of our women from achieving excellence. This begins with effective major institutional changes from within our society. We have an over-empowering constitutional obligation that requisite legislations are enacted timely and promptly. All that we require is efficacious implementation of the existing laws and to enact the future laws as and when the problems are foreseen. The promised rights, opportunities and safe spaces must transcend into reality for our women. We would like to see that in the coming Union Public Service Examinations show many more girls achieving great heights as you have seen a few days back. But my dear friends, we must also keep in mind that courts have their own judicial limitations. The courts do not have a magic wand to solve every puzzle. The other stakeholders, civil society, legislature, executive, academia, young students, everyone has to come forward and take Vishakha or its full of actions to a greater height and to a new pedestal. The Supreme Court verdict in Vishakha is truly an apt paradigm for our nation which opened up the discussion on the condition of our working women. I wish to remind ourselves the court by one of the greatest scholars of our nation, Swami Vivekananda, and I quote, All nations have attained greatness by paying proper respect to women, that country and that nation which does not respect women have never become great, nor will ever be in future. That's what Swami Vivekananda said. If we aspire to be a superpower in this century, we must abide by the thumb rule of progress given very happily by Dr. Ambedkar and his one line statement I like and I really wish to quote is he said, I measure the progress of a community by the degree of progress which women has achieved. This is my personal belief that institutional platforms like the Central University of Haryana or other education institutes can play a very active, dynamic role in sensitizing every section of the society. It's not that only the women need to be made aware of their rights or how to prevent the violation of their rights. It is equally important that they are an integral part of the society, namely the male, who also need to be sensitized about their duties and responsibilities. I am very sanguine that the departments of the university, like its ICC committee, will continue to make a level and will leave no stone unturned in ensuring that not only the thousands of students of 33 departments of the university, but even outsiders are made part of a public movement which ensure full respect and dignity to our mothers, our daughters, our sisters, our wives and one and all in the society. I 
ายชั้นก็คือพระเพสตังกิสวรรเลนิวไบซันส์เลอันดิสทีมของอะคาเดมีนและเอสเปซีมาอีกเดียร์สตูเดนต์ที่ทุกวันนี้ที่นี่ทุกวันนี้ที่นี่ทุกวันนี้ที่นี่ทุกวันนี้ที่นี่ทุกวันนี้ที่นี่ทุกวันนี้ที่นี่ทุกวันนี้ที่นี่ทุกวันนี้ที่นี่ทุกวันนี้ที่นี่ทุกวันนี้ที่นี่ทุกวันนี้ที่นี่ทุกวันนี้ที่นี่ทุกวันนี้ที่นี่ทุก